This panel we will focus on, is it possible to extend human lifespan with treatments that target the mechanisms of aging? So first of all, I would, I would like to our panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, yeah, so I'm Aubrey de Grey. I have two jobs. One of them is I'm the Chief Science Officer of uh, Sense Research Foundation, uh, which is a biomedical research charity working out of Mountain View that does um, rejuvenation research. Uh, the other job I have is I work for the guy over there, uh, Mike West, who uh, runs a company named Ajax that is doing parts of rejuvenation research that we don't do, basically because he and other people do it so well. Um, that, uh, so Ajax is very important in, in this thing too. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Gordon Lithgow. I'm from the Buck Institute, which uh, check us out if you haven't seen us before. We're the largest and oldest research institute focused on ageing in the world. Uh, we're 40 minutes north of the Golden Gate Bridge in a beautiful facility, and I'll personally take you around and show you if you're interested. Uh, my day job is running a lab there, and I'm also the chief academic officer. Uh, but another job that's cropped up in the last few months is uh, as a co-founder of a company, an ageing drugs company called Gerostate Alpha. We're a Y Combinator company, and we're in a seed round right now, and that's a ton of fun. I'm Mike West. I'm the CEO of Ajax Therapeutics uh, across the Bay, East Bay. Uh, I have a long-standing interest in aging and uh, regenerative medicine in particular. Thank you. Um, so, question for Aubrey. Um, so, there have been many hypotheses about why, why we age and how. Um, is there a general consensus these days? Yes, there is. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I can really say this now. You know, um, historically, there was this huge spectrum of attitudes about what aging is because we started out with the observation that people get sick when they get old and people looked at the ways in which they get sick and they thought of them rather in the same way that they think about the ways that people get sick when they're young. In other words, as individual diseases. And it took a pathetically long time for people to realize that this was the wrong way to look at the health problems of old age. But eventually, maybe a century ago, people got to the realization that no, actually, um, the, uh, you, know, you shouldn't think of this as one disease uh, and another disease and so on, especially because if you want to fix them, fixing them one disease at a time is never going to work, not least because these, these things happen you know, more or less at the same time, so the next one's going to kill you very soon. Um, so things shifted to a more preventative uh, uh, um, philosophy, and the whole field of gerontology arose maybe a century ago from the realization that, yes, we should be more preventative, um, and indeed the inspiration from the living world, that there's a great variation in how long, how slowly or how fast different species age, or even within a species. Um, and that was fine, but it swung too far in the opposite direction into a situation where people were looking for theories of aging and there were all these ostensibly competing ideas of whether it was free radicals or whether it was telomeres or whether it was this or that. And, um, you know, it was, it was just, like, based on nothing. You know, ultimately, there was no reason to believe that there would be one unitary reason, why, you know, underlying driving force that, that, that caused everything to, bad to happen late in life. And so now we have gravitated as a field in a very clear sense. I think this is something that we can totally say is the absolute mainstream view now to something in between. Namely that there's a small number and different people come up with different numbers but they're all between 6 and 10 I think. I think my number is 7. Um, that um, of basic mechanisms, basic types of damage that the body does to itself throughout life that are initially harmless because the body is set up to tolerate a certain amount of them, but then cause problems. And the relationship between the types of damage and the types of problem is a many-to-many -many relationship, a complex thing, but that's kind of okay. So this is what, of course, has led to the whole damage repair approach of you know, getting people to be healthier for longer by intervening at the point of the damage. So I agree with absolutely everything you just said, Aubrey. I, I think, though, the, and we've heard this a couple of times tonight about the animal models that we've been using in, in geroscience for the, for the last 15, 20 years. They're not good. They're, they're fat, they're docile, they're, um, they're bred that way. 
they're fertile, but they're not optimized for research on longevity. They're optimized not to expect humans. They're optimized not to expect, that's right. I'm talking about animal models right now. But you're right, these humans may share some of those similarities. But um, they, I, I, and I think there's a danger here. So we have whatever it is, seven pillars of aging. And they've been based on studies in worms, flies, and mice in deeply unhealthy conditions. And, and that's just a caveat. And I think that there's likely to be new mechanisms, additional pillars to come. I think there are aspects of aging that are still profoundly mysterious. So the, the question was, is there a consensus or a unity or whatever? Yeah. I, I want to stay focused on your question. Um, I'm more optimistic uh, about the unification of the theories. Um, than maybe most. Um, I, you know, I keep pointing back to the Hayflick phenomenon. So when I entered the field, I, I chose to do the human model. I mean, the fibroblast model is the only thing we had to put in a dish, right, from human. And, um, you know, to study aging. And it just, it, it's, maybe it's a reflection of me getting old. But in those days, you know, back in the um, 80s and in particular, um, there wasn't, I don't think you could find a serious aging researcher in the world that believed that would ever understand or intervene in cell aging. Uh, because people were cataloging, Len Hayflick used to catalog hundreds of changes in a senescent cell, you know, that reached the end of its replicative lifespan. Changes in the nuclear membrane and the, as you guys know, it, it was one gene, right? Telomerase immortalized cells. And I, I, th I, my prediction, but you know, we don't have time to get into all the details, is, is that we're going to see a collapse of all these theories into uh, a unified hypothesis. That, it, yeah, it won't, it won't be one gene anymore for the rest of aging, but it's, it's going to be strikingly simplified by the new science, I predict. So, Mike, you mentioned telomeres, so how their length is related to aging, actually? Well, you know, I, I'm looking out and meeting some of you. I know a lot of you have an interest in life extension, not just reducing health care costs for our nation and Medicare problem and all that. So, um, so if we're going to dramatically extend human lifespan, you've got to deal with telomeres. So uh, the, the, the turn was presenting you know, about re restoring youthfulness to cells by reprogramming, but saying, but, but telomeres aren't reset you got to ultimately re reset telomere like because it's a brick wall. We know that telomere shortening is occurring. You know, cells have however many doublings, however you want to calculate it, you know, 100 or less doublings uh, in the case of humans, and you're going to hit the Hayflick limit. It's a brick wall. So telomeres are ultimately have to be part of the equation of aging intervention, I would suggest. Thank you. Um, Gordon, what about proteins? Actually, some of your recent research focuses on that. How is that related to aging? Yeah, I mean, what, what's really important is, is protein shape, which is required for, for function. And, and during aging, uh, many proteins lose their shape and lose their solubility. And this is uh, clearly seen in, in plaques and Alzheimer's disease and so on. But it's, it's not just beta amyloid and alpha synuclein and some of those neurodegenerative proteins that do this. Thousands of proteins are doing this during normal aging. And we think that those proteins are really important in driving aging pathologies. Um, for example, we published many years ago in Nature a series of small molecules that pr promoted protein homeostasis, promoted protein three-dimensional shape. And uh, one of those compounds we've moved into a mouse model. We, the original screen was done in C. elegans in the tiny worm. We move the compound into a mouse model and it protects against, well, you might expect uh, Parkinson's disease because there's a protein aggregation uh, uh, aspect to that disease. But it also protects against bone loss, you know, a completely different functional domain. And I think that's exactly what you'd expect if you're actually targeting an aging process that's important across the board, different tissues, different diseases. So yeah, important. Yeah, I want to say a bit about, uh, to amplify a little bit of what, the latter part of what Gordon said, because this is actually a really important thing that has come up only in the past couple of years. So when I was talking earlier about how the right way to look at aging is that it is a multi -pro it's a multifactorial process, it's, just, it's a reasonably manageable number of processes, you know, half a dozen or more. Um, the thing is, there is going to be crosstalk between those processes. The amount of damage of one type that you have is going to influence the rate at which the other types of damage accumulate thereafter. And therefore, if you, can res if you eliminate one type of damage, you are going to see a beneficial effect. But what has come up only very recently 
in, uh, I think has absolutely astonished everybody in the field, is the magnitude of that crosstalk. Historically, if you'd asked me five years ago, I would have said that maybe mitochondrial mutations have a pretty pervasive you know, permeation across other things, but other things are going to be rather close to independent from each other. They're not completely independent, but nearly. But what we've seen with synolytics, with the elimination of senescent cells, is... I mean, I don't think even the major proponents and pioneers of that field, people like Julie Campisi, would have expected five years ago or ten years ago that we would see as broad a beneficial effect as we are actually seeing. So what about the um, pluripotent stem cells, Mike? Well, um Aubrey gives the example sometimes of an uh, old antique car, right? So you can keep them on the road. And that's a very simple idea. It, I, I, some of those of you that know me, my dad had a, a trucking business uh, up in Michigan, and I worked in his parts department. And he died of a heart attack uh, at a young age. And we had components for everything that could go wrong uh, with a, a, a truck, you know, the valves and crankshafts. You could come in, we could replace anything, get the truck back on the road. But it bothered me that we couldn't get some that we cared for back on the road, so to speak. We had no way of making young cells of any kind to repair, simply do, you know, do a surgical repair of, of cartilage. The number one complaint in aging is the pain of arthritis, right? The weight-bearing joints. We didn't have a way of making new cartilage for your joint. You can put in metal and plastic, or, or uh, rebuilding heart muscle after a heart attack, or dopaminergic neurons for Parkinson's disease, or the retinal cells that cause macular degeneration. So what we did years ago is we invented a platform. It's called pluripotent stem cells. These are immortal cells that maintain telomeres at the very beginning of life. They can be propagated indefinitely, and then make any cell of the human body that's born young. So it's an industrially scalable platform to make young cells of any kind, genetically engineered in any way, and almost certainly that's going to be another tool in the toolbox of aging, at least some of us think. Thank you. Um, as a last question to all three of you, as an investor, what kind of, you know, kind of repair and what um, areas would you focus on? What is the next wave? I'll start. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we all talk to a lot of investors, but um, I'm going to make very clear to any investors or potential investors in the audience that the divide and conquer approach that, as I mentioned earlier, is now the consensus understanding of what aging is and how we might defeat aging is something that investors need to pay attention to. The investors that have got most involved at this point, investors like Juvenescence and Apollo and Kazoo, they've all understood that the right way to go about this is to get involved in multiple different things, very diverse technologies of repairing different types of damage, so that not only have they got simply a lot of shots on goal, because of course these are investors who are coming in at an early stage where there hasn't been all that much de-risking going on, and there's going to be failures, right? Not only that, but also once they winnow down and you know, they have the successes, those successes will synergize. They will work, to, the, the, the technologies that multiple companies, multiple entities are developing will add up in terms of the health benefits to considerably more than the sum of the parts. That is the way that investors need to think, not to prioritize a particular technology at all, but in fact to actively not do that. Um, going back to the initial framework was why should investors invest in longevity? To make a ton of money. I mean, everything that we are seeing in the laboratory right now says that the companies that build drugs that target aging processes are going to be vastly successful. And there's also that nice warm feeling of doing something for humanity as well. So, One of the things to consider is we're well into that demographic tsunami of the aging boomers in the United States and in Japan and China and a lot of the other countries around the world. And um, I think, the, it's a little self-serving, I suppose, because it's what we're doing, but um, it's what I honestly believe. Um, targeting the degenerative chronic diseases of aging 
directly uh, with a reparative technology is the smartest investment uh, because uh, you know slow. I'm all a fan of, of slowing aging, but slowing aging will not help all the people right now and with de degenerative joint disease or spinal degeneration or heart failure. Uh, their, their patients are in an acute phase and with this booming population, we need to go out and, and give them new heart muscle, new cartilage, meet the needs of the aging population directly, the medical needs that are costing our country 80% of our healthcare expenditures, these chronic degenerative diseases. Mm -hmm. So I think just looking at supply and demand, uh, we can approach, we can take the science we have, which is just miraculous, really. I mean, it really is. You guys know what's going on, right? I mean, what's going on in the labs right now is just, just amazing. But you know, applying it to directly meet the needs of a society that's already old is the smartest investment, in my opinion. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Um, any questions from our three wonderful panelists? Yeah. If you could have a breakthrough in one area that would accelerate you or accelerate this one, I've got that. Oprah Winfrey. Uh, no, I mean, I'm actually serious about this. So everybody in this field since forever has known that they could do far more if they had a bit more money. Everybody has known this. Now, the situation has got considerably better. Let's not be, let's not be dishonest about this. Over the past few years, because of investors coming in, the private sector coming into existence, startup companies actually getting funding. But there are still plenty of areas where that's not true. And at the end of the day, the reason why is because even as of today, you still can't really write a grant to the NIH and say, hello, I'd like to really defeat aging and hope to get it funded. Right? Um, and, um, you know, that's a real problem. But it's only a problem because at the end of the day, the NIH is a tool of the government. And the government have exactly one priority in life, which is to remain the government. In other words, to get re-elected, right? Um, so ultimately, until public opinion changes, we are still going to have an enormous problem moving this forward as fast as the simple difficulty of the science allows. And that is only going to happen if opinion formers start telling people that this is actually a problem that is, first of all, a bad problem, and second of all, a solvable problem in the foreseeable future. So I really mean it when I say Oprah Winfrey. And, and uh, let me be clear, progress is occurring. Now, one thing that I like to point to that's happened really literally over the past two years maximum, maybe less than that, is the rehabilitation of the word rejuvenation. You know, 15, year, 15 years ago, I named my journal Rejuvenation Research, and I had a battle to get that name accepted because the publishers thought this was associated with cosmetics, you know, and it was just the wrong name. And I, it wasn't just then. Uh, a couple of times after that, over the years, the publishers came to me and I had to really fight not to have to change the name of the journal. But now we've got... George Church starting a company called Rejuvenate Bio. We've got Helen Blau starting a company called Rejuvenation Biotechnologies. We've got, you know, uh, Anne Brunet. Uh, th these are all really top people, in case you didn't know. Anne Brunet writing you know, really authoritative reviews with the word rejuvenation in the title, meaning what it actually means, reduction of biological age. So, you know, this is where things start. If experts start speaking in different languages, then opinion formers start speaking in different languages, and the public start thinking differently, and governments start behaving differently, and we guys actually get to be able to do our jobs. You all agree? I, I, absolutely, absolutely. Need, we need public opinion behind us. Uh, I think something that will help there are some big wins, like whether it's Restore Bio or Unity Biotechnology, where clinical success in clinical trials will, will potentially transform everything. So right now, Center Linux is sort of the area that gets a lot of attention to investment. What might be the best way? And is that going to be a useful thing to focus on, or is there something else that should be the next way that we're not focusing on? Well, uh, one, one thing I would predict, and you know, we'll see if I'm right, um, is that, um, so we talked about uh, telomeres and telomerase. Telomerase is an immortalizing enzyme, right? So it turns off, it's on in your germline, makes babies young. 
and then turns off in your body, right? It turns off very early. I mean, it, it, at early what age? In, early in embryogenesis, you know, I mean, it, it turns off in most what, what the number, tissues. What a number, right? Well, I mean, the first couple of weeks in most tissues. So just your body's just beginning embryogenesis, and it says, oh, you're becoming a somatic cell. You're going to die, so you don't need this enzyme. So he turns it off. The clock starts ticking, but you've got a long, long, long way to go before senescence occurs, right? That's the telomere story. But there's another switch, at least one more switch. That There's multiple switches, but there's one more switch that occurs in the body later, after the embryo is formed and all the organogenesis is complete, you turn off the ability to regenerate a tissue. So these animals that can regrow legs and things are stuck in that pre-fetal or pre-adult state. And uh, we had it once. Our, the human body had a profound regenerative potential, uh, but you turn it off once organogenesis is complete. We think it's to prevent cancer just like telomerase is shut off. But guess what? Animals that have telomerase on and can regenerate, don't age. At least most of them that we you know we know about. You know, lobsters and planaria and hydra and all these animals, there's no organismal uh, aging. So, but even if we're wrong about all that and turning on, we could, and it's possible to turn on regeneration again, which is what we're working on at AJAX, we call it induced tissue regeneration. It's kind of like ERA you heard about earlier. Even if we're wrong about that, the ability to regenerate a tissue, like a, the heart muscle would have a profound impact on medicine. But um, what if uh, aging is like August Weissmann, the German scientist from back in the 1800s, he made a prediction. And he was right about the Hayflick phenomenon. You know how you see these ads in the newspaper, it says, this man predicted the uh, crisis in 2008, now he's predicting this. Well, Weiss, Weiss, August Weissmann predicted cell senescence, that cells in the body were, or had a finite lifespan. He also predicted that tissues lose the ability to regenerate a tissue, and the two together cause aging. What if he's right? And what if we can turn on regeneration and extend telomeres, and that is the reversal of human aging? That would be a big deal. Wow. Thank you. And um, thank you all for this wonderful discussion. Um, and yeah, we're d with the last panel.